first of all very warm welcome to one and all to the first session of the 11th international workshop on adr and the second session and the second session will be going to conduct on 12 december which is tomorrow before moving ahead let's appreciate the mediate guru who took the initiative to gather us on this platform to learn us to learn together So Mediate Guru is a social initiative led by members across the globe. The organization aims to bridge the gap between the general public and litigation. We are creating a social awareness campaign for showcasing mediation as the future. We have successfully conducted various international webinars promoting alternative dispute resolution with a reach in more than 100 countries around the world having an international family growing each day. we try to provide you with the best lecture series through the best speaker around the globe so that you have a valuable edition today i feel honored to welcome our esteemed speaker for session first of this international work workshop ms maria luisa dominici morico ms maria is a also associate solicitor at the office of the solicitor general of philippines she has obtained her Master of Law at Columbia Law School in 2019, where she was a recipient of the Parker School Recognition of Achievement in International and Comparative Law. She is a recognized arbitrator of the Office for Alternative Dispute Resolution in the Philippines, the Assistant Deputy Secretary General for Case Management of the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution. She is assistant vice president for the strategic partnership of the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators, and a member of the PDRCI Rules Revision Committee and a trained arbitrator with the file uh, counsel of the PDRCI. Thank you so much for uh, for joining everyone. Without any further ado, let's begin. I would request the speaker to take the session forward and enlighten us. Please, please. free to ask any question the chat box is open for all please ma all right uh hi paras uh can you hear me uh completely yes, well yes all right thank you so much paras for that very generous introduction and good good evening everyone um as paras said i am maria luisa dominique de mauricio that's a handful and it is my honor and privilege to be speaking about international arbitration today here in mediate gurus 11th international workshop on adr before i start with anything i would just want to con Vice Sirius, thank you, Param, Bamra, Garima, and Paras, and the rest of Mediate Guru for this very golden opportunity. And let me start by sharing you my slides. Uh, just give me a few moments. Um, I'm having a bit of a difficulty here. Almost there. All right, there you go. So let me start with giving you an idea of what I will be speaking about in the next hour. First, I will be defining what arbitration is, and then I will go on to discuss when is an arbitration considered international, and I will end with why international arbitration is currently the most preferred mode of resolving cross-border disputes. As a caveat, and just so we are all on the same page, we would only be doing an introduction to international arbitration. There is a plethora of other topics in international arbitration that are very much worth worth discussing. However, we do not have the time for every single one of them. If there is any additional topic you would wish to discuss, I will be leaving my email address at the end of the presentation, and you are more than welcome to message me, and we could discuss your desired topic further. And just some house rules, as Paras very much mentioned a while ago, I have allotted some time for questions at the end of the lecture. So please feel free to send in your questions and just 
or if you would want, you can just list them down and type it in later. But in the interest of budgeting our time, I hope you would not mind if I would try and finish my lecture first and answer all your questions in the end. Every so often, I will be posting a poll question for everyone to answer. And this is just really to check if everyone is still with me. Uh, but uh, please, um, we encourage you, Paras, you can also um, answer this poll question. I would very much love to see your answers. And also, Garima and and Paramount there, please answer the poll questions with everyone. So let us start. The first question that we will be answering is a pretty basic and obvious one. And that is, what really is arbitration? I always like to start defining arbitration in the negative, and that is through showing everyone what dispute resolution mechanisms are not arbitration. I find doing this easier through a spectrum of dispute resolution mechanisms. That is right in front of you right now. And how does this spectrum actually work? The left side most is the kind of dispute resolution mechanism that does not involve any external intervention up until the right side most being the kind that involves the most institutionalized external intervention there is. Now let us start with the one on the far left or negotiation. So negotiation is a strategic discussion that resolves an issue in a way that both parties find acceptable. Here, the parties themselves, without anyone, try to figure out the solution to their disputes, as illustrated in that small drawing I have for you on your screens. A notch up to the right of the spectrum is mediation. There is now someone else, the one in white, um, a third party who guides and serves as a facilitator in the negotiation process. That is why, as you can see, that third party is on the same level with the two parties. He or she does not have any ruling power over the parties and really merely facilitates the discussion of the two. And um, if you want like a scientific definition of mediation, mediation is a con consensual process where the parties would have to select a third party neutral called the mediator who will mainly do two things. First, he or she will be facilitating communication between the two parties. And second, that mediator would be assisting the parties in reaching a voluntary agreement regarding a dispute, which is usually embodied in what is called a settlement agreement. A step to the right of the spectrum after mediation is arbitration. Based on the spectrum, generally arbitration is a step back from court litigation, meaning it has its similarities with court litigation, but it does not have to follow the strict rules that are in place for courts. In arbitration, the third party in the drawing is placed higher than the parties. And this is because the arbitrator is not only a guide or a facilitator as a mediator is, but an arbitrator is someone who will really decide the dispute for the parties. We will be defining arbitration further in a moment. But for now, the objective is for everyone to understand where arbitration lies in terms of the other dispute resolution mechanisms so that you may be able to fully understand the nature of arbitration. Let me explain that further through comparing arbitration with court litigation. The main difference is that court litigation is not voluntary. Uh, in litigation, one person can file a case against another person who may not even want to resolve the dispute in the first place. In arbitration, the two parties would have to both agree that they want to go to arbitration. Another key difference is that in court litigation, it is a preordained person by the government, referred to as a judge, that is assigned to render a decision for that particular case. Parties could not choose who will decide their dispute, something you can very much do in arbitration. As I pointed out earlier, arbitration awards the decisions by arbitrators in an arbitration, 
and decisions by a judge are both not advisory. And you can see that also in the um, drawing that I have for you down there, except that me and Paris is, um, are covering uh, that drawing. But down there, you would see the same illustration as you saw in arbitration. Thank you so much for that, Paris. Um, so as you can see now, it's the same illustration with arbitration, wherein your third party um, that will be designing your dispute is above the two parties. And that is because decisions by the arbitrators and the judges are both not advisory. But in decisions of judges, there are grounds to ask the higher courts to review again the court's decision. This is not the case in arbitration. We will discuss that further later. For now, what you have to remember is that in arbitration, the award is final and binding once it is rendered. And just to see if you're still with me, um, I have with me my first poll question, which I will be launching right now. There you go. So which proceedings will result to a binding resolution? Is it A, negotiation, B, mediation, or C, arbitration? Now, thank you so much for participating in the polls. Maybe we can give it a few more seconds. Some of you are changing your answers. That's cute. Okay. All right. All right. Maybe. Okay. That would do. And let's end poll. So Paris, would they be able to see the poll or is it just us who sees it? All right. Either way. Um. So here. So if, if you're seeing it or if you're not seeing it. We all can see it now. Right. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, Paris. So here, as you can see, majority of Everyone here in this room is actually right. It is um, arbitration that will result to a binding resolution. Okay. Next. All right. Now that you know what is not arbitration and where arbitration lies in terms of the other dispute resolution mechanisms, let us proceed to defining what arbitration is. I realized um, it, uh, there is no really uniform scientific definition of what arbitration is. And, um, uh, and if you would go through the different books, you would see that um, there is variance in terms of wording of uh, how the people, would, the scholars, um, the practitioners would actually define what arbitration is. But if you will go through every single one of them, all their elements, the key elements are pretty much the same. And here for today, I would be using the definition in my jurisdiction, the Philippine um, uh, ADR Act. And it's because it's simple, it's familiar to me, and I can very much take questions from you guys if we would be using uh, this particular definition. And I'm sort of getting there. So what I will do is I would read through the definition that's in front of you, and then I will be breaking down the definition into smaller uh, phrases and parts so that we may be able to get the broader picture of what arbitration really is. And, and when I'm doing this, you will see that I'm actually trying to walk you through the key salient features of arbitration. So let me start by reading the slide in front of you for um, emphasis if you have not read this part on your own. So what is arbitration? Arbitration is a voluntary dispute resolution process in which one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the agreement of the parties resolve a dispute by rendering an award. Now let me start off with the first word that I want to define more, and that is voluntary. 
Arbitration is a consensual process that requires the agreement of both the parties. The premise is because you are not going through the main dispute resolution process, which is prescribed by law, which is the courts, then you would have to explicitly agree to this quote-unquote deviation. A party cannot be required to submit to arbitration any dispute which he or she has not agreed so to submit. And related to this fact is the fact that arbitration is contractual, meaning the parties should have a meeting of the minds that both agree to bring their dispute to arbitration. And I keep on repeating this just so um, you would ingrain in your um, in in your being that arbitration is voluntary um, and um, usually in commercial settings uh, and and. It is usually in commercial settings that arbitration is being utilized, especially nowadays. This agreement is embodied in the contract. But keep in mind that um, arbitration is voluntary and both of the parties should actually agree to arbitration. Next is that arbitration is a dispute resolution process. Arbitration is the use of an impartial adjudicative procedure which affords each party the fullest opportunity to present their case. Since the arbitration will produce a final and binding decision through an award, it is imperative that a particular form and formal procedure should be adhered to for the arbitrators to be fully apprised of the nature of the dispute. I always emphasize that it is this trait that distinguishes arbitration from other forms of alternative dispute resolutions, wherein the parties could pretty much determine how the dispute resolution process will go. In arbitration, parties would have to go through an imposed procedure in order for due process rights to be fulfilled. The next uh, phrase uh, that I want to discuss with you is that um, emphasize, emphasized on your screens. And disputes resolved through arbitration are decided by one or more arbitrators, which are called usually the arbitral tribunal. And these arbitrators, collectively called as the arbitral tribunal, are appointed in accordance with the agreement of the parties or the rules that the parties subscribe to. Arbitration is really submission of your disputes to a non-governmental decision maker selected by or for the parties. The disputes will be resolved by the arbitral tribunal composed of the number of arbitrators the parties desire. Keep in mind that the arbitral tribunal operates extrajudicially. It is out of court. It is a private dispute resolution mechanism with minimal interference from the court. Next, disputes brought to arbitration are resolved by the arbitral tribunal's rendering of an award. Arbitration results in a final and binding de decision by a third-party decision maker that decides the party's dispute in a final manner, subject only to limited grounds for challenge in national courts. In arbitration, there is no appeal or certiorari in your arbitral award. The previous slide is your basic definition of what arbitration is. The next slide here that I have for you has some other key characteristics of arbitration that would help you understand and imagine the concept more. And I want to start with something with a characteristic that arbitration is very big on, and that's the principle of party autonomy. Party autonomy simply means that both parties may agree to do or not to do something. In arbitration, this just means that the parties have the freedom to choose one, who will arbitrate their disputes, and two, how their disputes will be arbitrated. 
So let's start with the freedom to choose who will arbitrate their disputes. In arbitration, parties are given the freedom to choose who will be the non-governmental, third-party neutral decision maker who will ultimately decide their dispute. Parties value this choice because parties cannot exactly choose the judge in a court litigation. Here, parties can choose an arbitrator that they feel would have the appropriate expertise or knowledge on the field of their dispute. Courts of general jurisdiction might not have the same appreciation of the case as compared to someone who practices in that particular field. So that's that's pretty much why they kind of want to appoint someone that is also practicing in that field. Parties can also choose an arbitrator that they feel would be able to give them ample time to hear and decide their case. And, and this is growing, um, this is a growing issue nowadays, especially for arbitrators with more cases than they can actually handle. Of course, there is a process for nomination and appointments of arbitrators, but ultimately the parties may choose who they want as their arbitral tribunal. Let's go to the party's freedom to choose how their disputes will be arbitrated. And that's pretty much called procedural flexibility. The intent is to dispense with the technical formalities of court proceedings and instead to tailor the procedures to their particular dispute into and and basically just to cater to how the parties would prefer their um dispute resolution process to be done. They can choose what rules of procedure they want to apply and also what to delete or add in these rules to be able to have a more efficient arbitration. Generally, because of party autonomy, parties can also agree that the arbitration proceedings can be confidential. The next characteristic that I have for you in our slide. Most parties consider arbitration for this particular freedom. When a party goes to court, Proceedings in general are open to the public and pleadings become and submissions become accessible to the public at one point. If the dispute is highly sensitive or involves issues that parties prefer to be private, they can choose to make their arbitration proceedings confidential. And that's something that they cannot do in courts as I have said a while ago. The next characteristic that I want to put forth is uh, is actually two. And it's, well, it's not a characteristic, but really an issue that I want to discuss, and that's cost versus speed. Admittedly, arbitration is more expensive than litigation. However, arbitrations are fairly faster than court litigation. The time spent litigating, for example, um, like a, um, a commercial case would take you years, wherein if you would go to arbitration, you can always agree, just as long as both of the parties agree and your tribunal agrees, to have a lesser time frame for your particular dispute. And the time less spent litigating translates into really a trimming down of costs um, for you as a party in your arbitration proceeding. The next characteristic that I want to highlight, and I, I touched upon this already a while ago, but I want to repeat it again, is that awards become final and binding once it is rendered. Arbitration produces awards, um, produces awards that produces a binding award. I'm so sorry, produces a binding award that decides the party's dispute in a final manner. And as I also said to you a while ago, this um, finality of uh, the award is subject to limited grounds for challenge um, in national courts. And I want you to keep in mind 
the differentiation of words that I used. I used challenge and not appeal. Awards are not advisory, as I also repeated a while ago, that the parties may accept or reject. And really, this means that any court or higher authority could not review errors of fact or law in an arbitral award. The last characteristic I have for you is the enforceability of the award. And the premise really is that since it's consensual, since the parties have actually both agreed to arbitrate their dispute, there will be willingness to abide by the award that will be rendered subsequently. And because of that willingness, it would be faster to inf enforce that award. And um, strictly speaking, there is nothing else a winning party would need to do in order to enforce the award. However, in reality, there would be losing parties that would not want to comply with your award. The winning party would then have to enforce the award through a proceeding in the courts that would have jurisdiction over the properties of the losing party. And we would be discussing that more a little bit later. The next, the next part is supposed to be an enumeration of the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration. I attended this one training and one of the professors beautifully discussed the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration in this way. She said that the advantages and disadvantages are really just different vantage points of the basic characteristics of arbitration. Example is, uh, let's say, the ease in the enforceability of the award. The winning party may see this as an advantage since it may readily have the award enforced. Of course, the losing party would see this as a disadvantage for obvious reasons. So the key takeaway is that the determining um, of what are advantages and disadvantages is really just a relative concept based on perspective. I have exhaustively laid down to you the characteristics of commercial arbitration, and it is really up to you to find your slant on which you may perceive our advantages and disadvantages once you find yourself in practice trying to weigh whether you should take your dispute to arbitration or not. Next are some principles that are often used in arbitration. And the first principle I have for you is the first principle that I have for you is confident is competence competence, and the arbitrator um and 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 basically here um the principle states that the arbitral tribunal may initially rule in its own jurisdiction, including any objections with their, with respect to the existence or validity of the arbitration agreement or any condition present. Pre pre precedent to the filing of a request of arbitration. Stated, so so I just, that's actually the definition in the model law, but stated in simpler terms, if the parties have objections to the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, they should first raise the objections to the tribunal and not to courts. And that's the principle of competence, competence. The next principle I have for you is uh, the principle, this is the doctrine of separability. And basically, the doctrine says that an arbitration clause, which forms part of a contract, shall be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. So the invalidity of the contract itself does not necessarily mean the invalidity of the arbitration agreement, except, of course, if the causes of such invalidity affects the arbitration agreement. The next principle I have for you is that the arbitral tribunal has, in its loose sense, limited jurisdiction. Arbitrators, one, do not have contempt power, two, do not bind third parties, and three, do not produce binding precedent. Since it is not a court of law, the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction does not, does not come from any law or any constitution. Hence, they do not have the inherent right to punitively harm any person that has been wronged by it, that has wronged it. 
that power only lies with the state. Remember that arbitration is a creature of consent. Hence, the consent is only valid on the people who have expressly acquiesced to it. Therefore, the arbitral tribunal may not render a decision that affects parties that did not consent to its, or to its jurisdiction. And lastly, there is no such thing as stare decisis in arbitration. The awards are not considered precedent that future lawyers may cite in their arbitration proceedings. The binding effect of the award is only on the two parties involved and in the particularly agreed dispute. Evidentiary, lastly, means that the arbitrators would have to decide a dispute based on the pieces of evidence that is presented to it. There is no such thing as a judicial notice in arbitration. One pertinent classification of arbitrations is whether the arbitration will be conducted with an assisting institution or just merely by the parties. Ad hoc is really just a do-it-yourself arbitration. The burden of running the arbitral proceedings falls entirely on the parties and once they have been appointed, the arbitrators. In the institutional arbitration, an arbitral institution provides assistance in running the arbitral proceedings in exchange for a fee. Assistance includes organizing hearings and handling communications with and payments to the arbitrators. Institutional arbitration may be beneficial for parties with little experience in arbitration. And, uh, and that's really because you would have an institution that will walk you through the different, um, the different administrative processes along the way. Now that we know what arbitration is, let us now determine when arbitration can become international. Essentially, arbitration really is just the presence or absence of a foreign element in arbitration. UNCITRAL, or the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, came up with a model law for international commercial arbitration. So this is... Um, the model law, as we call it, is a legislative text, which was really a suggestion to legislatures around the world on what kind of arbitration law should each state have. This was done so that there might be some uniformity on the arbitration laws of all, if not most, jurisdictions globally. The idea was that international trade would be easier if there was uniformity or similarity of laws among the states. Currently, 118 jurisdictions have already adopted the law. Hence, I always say that it is safe to assume that the definition or any doctrine for that matter contained in the model law is largely accepted in, in most jurisdictions around the world. Having said that, the model law defines what international is by giving us five distinct scenarios on what, on when can arbitration be considered as international. And you have that right in front of you right now. And let me take you through each one. So if at the time of the conclusion of your agreement, the parties to an arbitration have their place of places of business in different states, then it is already considered as international. And the explanatory note of the Uncitral Model Law actually says that majority of um, the contracts that actually go to arbitra international arbitration fit in this number one scenario. Next, um, if either one, the designated place of arbitration, or two, the substantial part of the obligations of the relationship, or three, the place with which the subject matter of the dispute is most closely connected is outside the state in which the parties have their place of business, um, then it is also considered international. 
And basically, this just says that um, even if the parties have the same places of business, thus taking them out of letter A over there, but if some other element of the arbitration is from a country other than the state of their place of business, then it is still considered as international. Lastly, if all the elements to the arbitration are from the state, but the parties have expressly agreed that the subject matter of the arbitration agreements relate to more than one country, then it may still be considered international. And the explanatory note said that letter C is actually the greatest acknowledgement of party autonomy. I would just have to point out that this is still very much contentious. Um, uh, there, is, um, there are some jurisdictions that don't recognize this as being international, but it is there in the model law. And this is really the, the textbook definition of what international is. The next slide shows you uh, in pictures essentially what international arbitration is in the model law. As you can see, just as long as there is at least one variance in the state or jurisdiction in any element of the arbitration, the arbitration may now be considered as international. And that's basically what international, uh, what international is when it is being defined um, through an international text, which is the model law. But what I do want to highlight is this on your screens. This is one particular difference that is not really extensively discussed in an academic setting, but I feel is important and key to understanding the difference between international and domestic arbitrations. And that is the cultural differences of the key actors in international arbitrations. Since international arbitrations involve elements that originate from different jurisdictions, almost always the parties also have different nationalities. Naturally, they have different cultural backgrounds, different expectations, different upbringings, different standards of living. And all these differences are coming into play into the arbitration that you have. To show you the practical aspect of the matter, here are two scenarios. And let me take you through the first scenario. And um, the first scenario is involves a purely Filipino arbitration. And uh, that's my example for the reason that, of course, I'm Filipino. And um, although I know that there are a lot, there's, um, there's a, a wide... Um, attendance here of different um, nationalities, but I kind of want to use um, my, my own nationality for this first scenario. And here you would see that both of the parties are Filipinos. Both their lawyers are Filipinos. There is um, a Philippine seat and the dispute arising um, from the contract was concluded in the Philippines and for the engagement of services to be performed in the Philippines. So everything and everyone in this scenario understands everything and everyone perfectly. If, for example, one lawyer would want to move for the, uh, let's say, resetting or the cancellation of a hearing, because, for example, there is no electricity in their area or there is no internet connection at this particular hour, everyone in that particular scenario would understand the predicament of that lawyer. Compare this with the second scenario, wherein you have a Filipino party, a German party, a Filipino lawyer for the Filipino party, and an American lawyer for the German party with India as the seat in a dispute arising from a contract concluded in Singapore for engagement of services to be performed in India. In this case, if, for example, um, the American lawyer would start to cite American jurisprudence or some common law concept, 
the Filipino lawyer or even uh, the German party would not have the particular understanding that that American lawyer has of the topic that he has opened. And um and and this this only scratches the surface and I can go on and on here I can go all day trying to uh, give you some differences in cultures like for example um, having one culture that is not outspoken while another culture um, interprets being outspoken to your hospitality or your warmness towards that person and then you have a disjunct with these two people. And um, and I hope this helps drive home my point that really just one important element of international arbitration that sets it apart from domestic is really the hodgepodge of cultures, upbringings, belief systems, and even ways of living that come into play during the entire arbitration. And with that, I want to move to my next poll question. And the question is, is this an international arbitration? So you have an American party, a German party. Your place of arbitration is in the States. Your place of substantial contract performance is in the States. And also the place of the subject matter of dispute is in the States. So is this an international arbitration? Oh, sorry, I haven't published it. So I was kind of waiting for your answers, but there you go. Okay, just uh, let's wait a bit for the people to answer. Please answer. So Para, Sparam, and Garima, are you actually answering as well? <laughs> All right, so maybe we can... Um, End it in about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. There you go. End poll. So 71 of you says that yes, it is international. And based on our discussion a while ago, if we would be using the model law definition of what international is, this particular scenario falls under the first paragraph of the model law that is saying that this is international. So your parties have places of business in different countries, in different jurisdictions, and that makes it international. All right. Uh, thank you for your participation. And now we move on to our last topic okay which is the question why you should choose international arbitration so choice comes from having options and just to be clear in this scenario we are choosing between international arbitration in one hand and litigation of international disputes in national courts on the other as a mode for resolving cross-border disputes, meaning disputes involving different jurisdictions. So I, I, I just, just want to point that, uh, just want to highlight that definition of cross-border disputes so we are on the same page. And most users worldwide chose or is choosing arbitration as opposed to litigation of international disputes in national courts. And this is according to the 2021 International Arbitration Survey by Queen Mary University of London and the firm White and Case. In that particular survey, it said that international arbitration is the respondent's preferred method of resolving cross-border disputes for 90% of the respondents. And of course, there's a variance with those that would choose arbitration as is, as a standalone basis, or in conjunction with other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. But what's important is that 90%, so that's a very high amount, of the respondents actually prefer international arbitration. 
That should be telling us a lot about the preference of practitioners and should be sufficient to answer our question why we should be choosing international arbitration. The next slide just enumerates some reasons why people are choosing international arbitration. If the statistics did not um, convince you, then I will be trying to convince you through some reason. And the first is because International arbitration is a centralized mechanism for the resolution of the dispute. Since the parties agreed to this type of dispute resolution tool, it immediately eliminates uncertainties on jurisdiction and choice of law. Relatedly, this also eliminates multiple litigation in different national courts. And this usually happens when litigation is chosen and the parties from different jurisdictions contend that it is their home court that have jurisdiction over their dispute. If you have arbitration where both parties expressly agree to the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, then the confusion of which court which which court which national court has jurisdiction is eliminated and that's why people choose arbitration the next uh, mother reason for choosing arbitration is because of party autonomy we quite extensively discussed this a while ago as one of the characteristic of our of arbitration but I need to put this here because um, this is really one of the main advantages of international arbitration over litigation in domestic courts. And um, I want to take you through uh, these um, two um, prongs of party autonomy again, but uh, sort of trying to contextualizing it in our particular discussion. And the first is the choice of who your arbitrators will be. And as you can see there, a bullet down there says that um, neutrality, competence, and expertise of the decision maker. And as we pointed out a while ago, national courts and um, the judges that have general jurisdiction of domestic issues are often ill-equipped to resolve international commercial disputes. And this is not for anything else. This is not capacity, but it's really because they are unfamiliar of the day-to-day -day practice of very specialized and highly technical commercial, international commercial disputes. They are very, judges are very much learned in um, domestic issues. And I can say that because my mother, who is actually in this um, in this uh, meeting right now, um, supporting me, is a judge. And I have nothing against judges. I have the um, I have the utmost respect for them. Uh, but uh, but the issues that they deal with day to day are not the same issues that are being tackled, that are being meticulously um, discussed in an international arbitration proceeding. And that is why international arbitration is very much preferred um, to uh, domestic uh, and national courts at this juncture. Sige. Um, next is procedural flexibility. Um, now I wanna uh, I, I I wanna discuss this also a bit more. I know I discussed this as well uh, a while ago, but uh, I, I just wanna point this out. Um, arbitration gives the parties broad autonomy to agree on the applicable laws that would govern their arbitration, and this enables them to dispense with the technical formalities of national court proceedings. And um, this is very much attractive for parties who are in jurisdictions with courts that have a lot of cases or with rules of procedure that are long and circuitous and unnecessary to the particular dispute. 
the last reason for choosing international arbitration, and I'm very much um, looking at the time here, is the ease in enforceability of agreements and awards internationally. Enforcement of arbitration agreements and awards, in essence, just means whether your agreement to arbitrate your dispute or your arbitration award may be recognized by ju jurisdictions different from your own. This is particularly important in cross-border disputes. And I want to show you how, why through an example. For example, um, for example, you have an arbitration award that was rendered in Germany, but the award will have to be to be enforced elsewhere, like, um, for example, let's say uh, Hong Kong. For example, the losing party, though the place of business of that losing party is in Germany, has majority of its assets in Hong Kong. As a winning party, it is good practice to make sure that your award rendered in Germany is valid and binding not just in Germany, but also in Hong Kong and other countries where you might possibly have to have your award enforced. If you will obtain a, um, a, dis a decision from German courts, you would naturally have to go to the domestic court of where you want that the German decision to be enforced. And going to that court really depends upon the procedure, the unique procedure of that foreign jurisdiction, that foreign court, which you would have to learn anew and you would have to be in depth. You would have to have an in depth knowledge of that procedure before you can actually enforce your German court decision. Arbitration does away with this formality and with all these um, extra, uh, your extra hassle um, that you would have to go through if you would go through litigation in another court. We have what you call the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Awards, or New York Convention as everyone would call it. The New York Convention requires courts of contracting states to give effect to private agreements to arbitrate and to recognize and enforce arbitration awards made in other contracting states. So notably, and, and this is just to give you um, a side-by-side a side by side opinion of the two, there are only few to none arrangements that seek to establish effective international enforcement of foreign court judgments. Hence, arbitral agreements and awards are easier to enforce than its counterpart. And that is why people actually choose um, international arbitration over cross border litigation. And with that, um, I would want to sort of wrap everything up just to show you again my outline. We discussed what arbitration is, when is arbitration international, and then concluded with why you as an end user, as a party, as an advocate should choose international arbitration for your cross-border disputes. And with that... Um, I'd like to say thank you. Um, that ends my presentation. As I promised, my email address is over there. Please, um, if, um, if, if, if you have any more uh, comments, suggestions that you want to send directly to me or you would just want to connect, please do email me or add me on LinkedIn. So thank you again, Mediate Guru, Param, uh, Garima, and Paras for having me today. It was such an honor. And now we're ready for your questions. I must say, ma'am, it was a very informative session. It, I, it was a very informative session. I said earlier, a question answer round. Now we'll take some questions from our lovely audiences. So the first question is, if we cannot uh, appeal against an arbitral award, how we can uh, challenge an arbitral award? All right. Um, so, uh, so the question that's actually a very good question. This is something that um, the the challenge of awards um, uh, are. Uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to just hold on. I'm <laughs> okay. So the challenge of the awards is something that, uh, that is a very good topic of um, international arbitration. And if we had a few more um, R's, actually, we would be touching upon this. And, and I, I'm, I'm again, I'm mindful of the time, but just to give you a short, brief answer, and, and I can, I can discuss with you, uh, personally as well, if you want some very detailed, um, uh, very detailed answers to this. It depends upon the jurisdiction where you want your award to be enforced. Um, the New York Convention gives grounds, um, it, as I told you, and if that particular jurisdiction, um, is a signatory to the New York Convention and has actually um, uh, has actually um, written into their domestic laws the New York Convention. Then the grounds in the New York Convention would be a very good place to look at to start with. Um, there are other uh, there are other um, reasons for challenge. It depends upon the jurisdiction as well. So um, that's my short answer uh, to that. Uh, yes, ma'am. So the second question is, what is conciliation? Is it far more better than arbitration? Do you believe that arbitration is against the principles of fair trial that is equal justice for equal person? Okay, um, so maybe, uh, so Param, so I, I'm sort of not hearing you entirely. So can you just answer? I, I, I heard a few questions in that. So may I just answer the first part first and then maybe we can go through um uh, we can go through um, the other the, the the end question and uh, um and the first question that, that if I remember she was asking was what that is whether, conciliation? Sure. Okay. So um, conciliation um, is a. Uh, it's uh this is conciliation is actually closer to mediation in that the parties are are actually being guided or being facilitated um to uh by a certain um third party neutral um for them to decide their disputes but the difference as um i pointed out a while ago is that in arbitration what happens is you have your arbitrator that decides for you it is the arbitrator that would be telling you would have the mandate to decide on the matter of the dispute, um, something that the conciliator does not have. And I think the next question was that whether um, I is it far prefer... more better than arbitration? Is it far more better than arbitration? All right. Um. So um. That's a that's a, actually a very good coffee table. Um. Or uh question um many people have different views on it uh but my view actually is that i come from the school that is very much pro alternative dispute resolution i don't want to say that i prefer one particular um alternative mode of dispute resolution over the other but i would want to say that it really depends on your dispute like how there are certain disputes that are very much for arbitration and there are disputes that are very much for mediation or conciliation and and um uh just to just but but just to give um uh, the person who asked this a, a context i actually prefer what they call the multi-tiered dispute resolution process and that is going through first mediation before you go to arbitration well if it's multi-tiered then it's um you can go first to negotiation and if that negotiation does not take place then you can go to mediation and if mediation is um uh it doesn't still work out in mediation you can go to arbitration and i, I point this out because um uh, I'm a believer that if an issue can actually be um, resolved by both of the parties on their own without any intervention of anyone, then that would be better because that would be faster and that would very much um, the clog court dockets, arbitration dockets, and and it's it's really for the good of everyone and also good for the parties um, because their disputes would be very much resolved from the very start. But that's my own view. Um, I think the 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 more um, appropriate view is it really depends on the type of dispute that you have. Um, there are really disputes that you have to bring to arbitration and those that you bring to mediation. 
so the third part of this question is do you believe that arbitration is against the principle of fair trial that is equal justice for equal persons Oh, oh, so no, absolutely not. So absolutely not, uh, Paras. And, and I thank that person for asking that question. And this is really to clarify. Um, this is something that, um, I have, uh, pointed out as well a while ago. Arbitration, in arbitration, both parties have to have their equal opportunity to present their case. There is, due process is very much prevalent if not more in arbitration than it is um in litigation and, and i say that because arbitrators do not have the imprimatur of the courts so in practice based on experience i would see arbitrators that would stretch the concept of due process stretch the concept of equal opportunity to be heard and um and I think that that gives both of the parties uh, more avenue, more leeway to present their case. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So the third question is, can you explain the difference between a seat and a venue in the international arbitration? Sure. Okay. So um, that's another thing um, that that I would um, that I would love to touch upon if this was a longer session, but um. Since it's it's just a few minutes, we did not discuss this, but that is a great question to ask. Um, seat is very much different from venue, and the simplest way that I could present this to you is through this. When you say the seat of arbitration, this is the juridical home of your arbitration. It is the law that would be governing your arbitration agreement, and. Just keep that in mind. That is your seat of arbitration. When you say venue, that literally means where you are going to arbitrate your dispute, where your hearings would um, take place. And I would want to give a like to give a concrete example so that it's ingrained in you. For example, you say that your arbitration is seated in, let's say, New Delhi in India. But uh, the venue of uh, your uh, the hearings for the arbitration is in, let's say, Singapore. So what happens is the law that would be applicable to your arbitration agreement is the law of India. But you would be holding, you would be physically holding, you would be flying to Singapore and hearing your case in Singapore. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, so the last question uh, for today's session is, what do you think of the emerging advent of arbitration in criminal matters, plea bargain aside? Right. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I, this is something that, so thank you for that question. Um, so as you know, I actually am as an as a solicitor. I'm from the Solicitor General's office. We defend the state for um, in criminal cases. So I I usually answer this question um, with that caveat, and um, uh, I always say that I am pro arbitration. Um, I have very much practiced arbitration, especially in commercial disputes, even in my office. Um, but I am doubtful as regards whether um, criminal matters should be arbitrated. Um, criminal matters, especially when plea bargaining is not being taken into consideration, involves um, an interest of the state, which I am not, well, as um, as um associate uh, as a solicitor from the solicitor general's office i am i am not prepared right now to say that um that interest of the state may actually be brought to um this particular type of alternative dispute uh, resolution well these were the questions thank you ma'am <laughs> for such a vibrant interactive and knowledgeable session I would like to thank all the past participants for joining us and I would request everyone to please fill up the feedback form before you leave in order to receive the certificate. Last but not least, before leaving, there are some great opportunities by Mediate Guru for you guys. 
Media First Media Guru has launched the second edition of second virtual international mediation competition 2022. The international mediation competition is a unique opportunity for students to learn and practice mediation and negotiation skills. So the role playing of mediation problem drafted by experienced mediation and uh, mediators and practice. And second, registration for mediation schools are batch to are open now. This course of the school is carefully crafted in order to strengthen a student's grip on the working of mediation and other ADR methods. This course will follow special curated topics covered by Dr. Ashu Diman Ma'am and other guest lectures from around the globe. All details available at www.mediateguru.com and if you don't want to miss any update any update from mediate group follow us on our social media handles and also join the whatsapp group the link has been sent in the chat box stay healthy stay safe see you soon see you all thank you